Ladies and gentlemen, part two by Doyne Rennie. Seems the ends of the show these days are the sort of ongoing experimental theater. We try and do some little something different every time. Um, so uh, here's our latest installment. There's not a whole lot of folk left in Texas, not since the fall. Those of us still around have a hard time of things. There surely ain't the great knowing of contraptions like there was in the old world. The sun's hot, a lot hotter than it used to be. On account of the rays, men don't go outside and show their skin of the sun. Honest folk do their business in the evening, though it was high noon when the Mexican walked into my bar. I'd only been scribing his tale a few minutes, and I already knew several things about the man. I knew he was a killer, had been since he's a boy. I knew that on a low and lonely Tijuana steel bowl platform, a Topeka engineer named a Dreamcatcher had hired the Mexican to kill the King of Texas. I didn't know at that time whether the King of Texas was alive or dead, but it wasn't that that scared me. It wasn't a killer sitting across from me on the table sipping his whiskey. It was a fact that he'd paid me gold to scribe his tale. I couldn't understand it. It was that not knowing that scared me worse than them cold rattlesnake eyes. He kept talking. Well, nothing I could do but keep writing. And her Nando said, Mr. Dreamcatcher, do you believe in God? He scratched under his sweat-drenched coat. I did not come south for middle riddles, Mr. Hernando. It's the Texas job that's important. In the hot country, in Texas and in Mexico, one must believe in God. The man in black shrugged. I believe in mechanology, etherics, steam. I believe that progress comes from the work of men, hard-working, self-made, profit-seeking men. Such men broke the old world. They say a day of fire consumed the old world, turned everything to ash. Under his scarf, Dreamcatcher sucked on his teeth. At Topeka, men are making a new Eden. That's what I say. Without seeing Dreamcatcher's face, I could tell his age. Too young to understand God and men. His dark goggles turned toward me. Will you deliver me a soul? I smirked. Senor. My only skill is trading souls for gold. I suppose that is why they call me El Diablo. As a young man, I had returned to Sawaro with a chest of gold for my mother. A box of souls, you might say. The Mexican sun had grown hotter in my absence. The towns were smaller, poorer, and the bones more plentiful than ever. I could see then what I had not as a boy, that Sawaro was a place long dead a carcass with worms in its marrow. I approached Mother's house at the outskirts. It was much smaller than I remembered. Mother met me at the door, but did not smile. There wasn't much of her, all dry and leathery. She said, My angel has returned. Did you bring food? I shook my head. What's that on your back? She was looking at my rifle a mess of tanks and tubes and gauges, welded from old world steel by a clever Tejas watchmaker very shortly before he met God. I showed her the rifle, I showed her how the gauges hiss and dance when they open the valves. I told her that at tres mil PSI it will shoot through a horse front to back. Her gray and lifeless eyes considered me. You have a killing machine. I shrugged. I said it was just air and tubes that a man does what it, with it what he must. I told her about the gold that I had brought. She moved back into the shadows of our little home and I followed. She leaned against a wall and said, I cannot eat your gold. I cannot feed it to the algae barrels in the cellar. No one comes to Sawaro anymore. Why did you come back? I came to help you, I said. I was glad that you left, my angel. Sawaro dried up after you left. Most of the people died. I did things to survive, things I never wanted to do. 
You know how it is. I did know how it was. She said, when you were a boy, you promised to take care of me. I remembered. I keep my promises, but I did not want to do what her sunken gray eyes asked. I had come with a rifle, but no food. And we both understood that in Mexico, you do what you must. Don't cry, she said. She closed her eyes, which was kind of her. I left two ounces of lead in my mother's house, and I never went back to Sawaro. I said to Dreamcatcher, do you know who guards a corpse? A corpse? The worms. I heard the steamboat's huffing breaths in the distance, the iron beneath my boots pulsed with its coming. Mexico is a sacred place, Mr. Dreamcatcher, a territorio blanco. When the old world died in fire, God did not die. That was the day he came back. He made a new Eden right here in Mexico. A land clean except for the few fallen and penitent souls he left to guard the place. Mr. Dreamcatcher sighed and fished in his pockets. He drew out a printed slip and dangled it between two fingers. The, hand is too, the land is too hot for philosophy. Will you trade a man's life for paper or not? Not gladly, but in your case I must. I snatched the paper from him. The steamboat squealed as it drew near. The platform thrummed, the air shook. I had never been so close to a steamboat before. It was a monstrous loud thing, stinking of iron and fire. Dreamcatcher grinned with relief as it stopped with a hiss and a clank. An ornate door clicked open. He stepped inside, tugged off his gloves, and shook the conductor's hand. Come, Manhel, the bull will carry us north to your target, then on to Kansas to redeem your gold. Ten bars will buy you a life of luxury in the cool country. Your heart will never long for Mexico again. I stuffed his banknote in my poncho and stepped back down the stairs, away from the bowl. He lifted his goggles and, with the shadowed within the shadowed belly of the bull, I saw his clean, green, green, ignorant eyes for the first time. I called out, It was men like you who broke the world, Dreamcatcher not men like me. Don't you know that God created the devil to destroy cunning men? Perhaps he did not hear me. He shouted, your target's name is on that slip of paper. Make sure that I never meet him. Dreamcatcher shut the door. The steamboat puffed its mighty breath. It surged and panted and its iron wheels spun then caught and the monster lurched into motion. Before it had moved ten feet, I pointed my rifle at the seams of its iron boiler and triggered the release. I do not actually remember the explosion. When my vision cleared, I was on the ground with a rain of iron and wooden chunks crashing in the dust all around me. I looked to the sky and saw a roiling mushroom of steam rising toward heaven, glowing gloriously in the sun. Now, I was prepared to believe he was a Mexican and a killer. But now that he'd killed a steamboat, I mean, they're ancient, they're priceless. He smiled, shrugged, finished his whiskey, started back toward the door. I looked at him expectantly, he said, you tell my story, senor. You tell it to every man going south. You tell them to stay the hell out of Mexico. <laughs>